The Job Corps was designed to help students to do better with their lives. I loved it. We were all such a close bunch of girls. She was pretty popular. And she was just a fireball. But she was on this, like, dark path. And that turned out to be a very toxic thing. This was totally different from anything I'd ever seen. The only other names that I can think of of people like this are Gacy or Dahmer. She said, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Love you. Bye. It was around daybreak, and this older couple that was walking came upon a wet spot in the pavement there, and the lady told her husband, she said, that looks like blood, and he said, no, that's probably transmission fluid. But sure enough, it was blood. When I got to the crime scene, I was led back there by one of the officers, and I had them all clear out because the crime scene, it was horrendous. I could see drag marks. Then you see the handprints. And then, of course, the body itself was just a mass of blood. I could see there was a lot of pain involved, and it went on for a while. This was totally different from anything I'd ever seen. The discovery of this body was just an unusual situation in Knoxville, Tennessee. Murders just didn't happen very often. And here, this was a horrific one, and one that would actually cause fright amongst all the people in the community. And no one is more terrified than the thousands of co-eds who call Knoxville home. Within walking distance of Tyson Park is not only the prestigious University of Tennessee, but the humbler Knoxville branch of Job Corps as well. Job Corps is a federal program. It was meant for uh, learning skills or trades. It was designed to help students get further education in such things as nursing, computer science, the culinary arts, and to give them an opportunity to do better with their lives. You went and you lived on site, and they would put you in class and help you get a job afterwards. My personal experience was great. I was away from home, and I was happy to not be 100% supervised all the time. I had fun. I was taking nursing, and I loved it. I met people from all different cultures and, you know, walks of life, and I loved that. I was in the nursing program, too. And I liked my, my friends that I had made. It was one floor of girls and three floors of boys. And so it was just us girls and then all those floors of guys. You know, we had our, our little um, residential moms that stayed on the hall with us that, you know, did their best to keep us in line. But we, we pretty much, you know, stay to ourselves. But the residential mothers have more to worry about than just keeping boys off the girls' floor. There is very much the same amount of drama and competition at Job Corps as there was anywhere else. There was always somebody vying for one place or status or in position, whatever, that they do in college. An 18-year-old nursing student, Krista Pike, would be voted most likely to come out on top. Krista's personality, it just filled the whole room. Krista was about 5'2", maybe 95 pounds, soaking wet. And most of that was her hair. And she was just a fireball. When Kim and her were really good friends, and Kim was an extremely good person. She was my best friend. But walking with Krista was sometimes a nightmare. I'm just trying to get from point A to point B, and she's got to stop and talk to yeah, everybody along the way. 
Krista arrives at Job Corps with dreams of a brighter future after a rocky start in life. Krista had been shuttled back and forth in a split marriage between father and mother, West Virginia, North Carolina, West Virginia, North Carolina. Hard life for Krista Pike. When Krista was 18, she had dropped out of high school, and her mother decided that Job Corps was the place for her. Despite all of that, a really smart girl. She was smart. When she said she was taking nursing, I thought that would be a great thing for her because she was very charismatic, but she was also very caring. She would do something to make you laugh or smile. Krista had a lot of friends. She had Kim and Amy and Colleen and Shadola. Krista and Colleen actually came in together. They were in the same orientation together. You kind of create a bond with the girls that you come in with. Colleen was studying computers, and she was a good student. She was determined that she was going to succeed there at the Job Corps. She was very studious. After she would eat, she would head to her room for a while to study. Usually, she was in a room with books. Shadala was studying culinary arts. She was a follower. She just wanted to fit in and, and be friends with whoever was most popular. Shadala wanted to be part of the crowd. She was a very quiet girl. She was absolutely the opposite of Krista. Krista was one of the few friends that Shadola had, and so she was very loyal to her. And there's nothing Krista values more than loyalty. She always wanted to make sure she had plenty of friends and plenty of people on her side. She would kind of went out of her way to make new friends, because Krista loved attention. She liked being the center of anything. She loved it. But Krista plays the popularity game to win, which means someone else has to lose. Krista definitely had a mean girl side to her. She was kind of a time bomb type. Just any little thing could set Krista off. I never knew what I was getting from her. She ran very much hot and cold. She wasn't afraid to just, like, lash out. She would scream and cuss and, you know, go off. It was just loud and obnoxious. I was like, why are you like this? I think she wanted people to think she was a big and bad person. I think that she had to outplay her small frame. Queen Krista rules the social circuit at Job Corps. And when she locks eyes with Tadaryl's ship one day after class, she is certain she's found her king. And she's like, who's that? He was like, who's that? So I introduced them. And they stood there talking, and that was, that was the end of it. They met on, let's just say, Wednesday. They were basically married by Friday. <laughs> it was an instant connection with them, too. And it was a very intense connection. It was almost like they were stuck together, like you never saw them apart. Tadaryl was 17, and he was studying culinary arts. Tadaryl was tall. He had a lot of friends. He was always on his way or coming back from somewhere. He was always doing something. Uh, he was friendly, liked to joke, just very active. He was a friend. I mean, he was on my floor. Now, Tadaryl got in the fights, but he wasn't like this bad dude. He was a cool guy. People liked him. He was intense as far as he kind of radiated anger when he was mad. When he was angry, I steered clear. I was like, no, I didn't need that. But Krista never saw a red flag she couldn't overlook. I think Tadaryl made Krista feel like she was, you know, the one and only, like, number one. He made her feel special. He made her feel like a princess because he was six, one maybe. But she was so little that he could just swoop her up. And, you know, I think she liked that. You know, she liked feeling safe and secure. As Krista enjoys the view from Tadaryl's arms, she can't hear the shade being thrown just out of earshot. 
I don't want to say I was happy for Krista when she was with Tadaryl because he was on this, like, dark path. Tadaryl claimed to be a Satanist, and he was really open about that. He made sure that he was kind of loud and proud about it, and he made sure that everybody knew it. Worshiping the Underlord, as he called it. He called him the Underlord. It was just weird. Knowing Krista before Tadaryl, you wouldn't think she would be the type to be into that. But she kind of changed. She was just really different. She definitely embraced that side of Tadaryl. She just kind of picked it up right along with him, I think. And that turned out to be a very toxic thing. Daryl had ornaments. He had a satanic Bible. Everything that was Satanistic, he followed. He introduced Krista to seances and to the Ouija board. He also had her kneel to the altar of Satan that he had in his room. This was his place of worship. I remember thinking, you know, this is really out there. And it was just the talk of the hall. It was talk of job court. There was even one night, and I remember this night, the RA of the floor, they do bed checks. And so they go to your room, open your door, and check on you. And she did a bed check, and so Daryl had Kristen in his room, which was a big no-no. There were candles lit in the room, and he was chanting stuff. And I remember it scared this dorm director so much, she just started yelling. And then security came up and broke it up. I think she was looking for something to make her feel stronger than what she was. I think she got a sense of power out of Satanism. He had a tattoo that said, baby Satan. Krista got a tattoo that said, little devil and she was quite proud of that. But to everyone else at Job Corps, the Satanism seems little more than cringy theater. Oh my gosh. Me and my roommate would call them doom and gloom because they would just be so serious. I think the whole Satanist thing was probably for show. As a whole, Job Corps students, we didn't think much of it. I thought it was 100% for attention. I took it as a joke. They may have just been dabbling in it just for fun, just to, uh, you know, just for the experience. You know, even good kids just think it's cool to do a seance. So a couple of months after Krista and Tadaro were dating, one day Tadaro was walking down the hall and Colleen waved at Tadaro, I guess. Colleen was very quiet, but friendly. She was starting to come out of her shell. She kind of blossomed and she waved because it was a friendly face she knew. He waved back, smiled. I thought there's not a big deal in that. Krista's like, Colleen's trying to steal my boyfriend. I said, no, she's not. She's really not. Krista might think Colleen is a backstabbing boyfriend stealer, but she's anything but. Colleen was shy, but if she meets somebody, she would be friends. She would say hi. Colleen was the type of child, she would please you no matter what. Colleen would do anything for you. She was a nerd, a geek, a nerd with coming with the computer, always at the lab, always trying to tinkle and take things apart. She did not care about any boys the whole time she was in school. I know she didn't have any interest in Tadaro whatsoever. But Krista has already made up her mind. Krista went to Colleen and said, why are you trying to steal my boyfriend? Colleen was like, I, I don't want your boyfriend. You know, they're friends, but, you know, nice guy, but I don't want him. Krista said, yes, you do. I'm going to need you to stay away from him. Colleen's like, done. But why forgive and forget when holding a grudge is so much more fun? 
Preston started spreading rumors that Colleen was messing with other guys, that she was easy, that she was trying to get with Tadaro, trying to steal Tadaro away, things like that. She would call her names just, hey, bitch, or hey, ho, or she's like, you, you ugly, ugly bitch. I mean, just all kinds of just things to, I guess, bring her down. I always felt horrible for Colleen that she had to deal with that. She single Colleen out to, you know, do that to her. I was just like, oh, I was so tired of hearing about it. Because I'd never seen or heard her act any way inappropriately towards her boyfriend. After weeks of abuse, Colleen decides to finally stand up to Krista. Colleen told Krista, she's like, I don't want your boyfriend. He's a nice guy, but she wasn't into guys like Tadaryl. What she meant by guys like Tadaryl, I don't know. But Krista just automatically assumed it was because he was black. I don't think Colleen was a racist at all. And I, I just remember how intense it was. And I remember Shadala being there too. And Krista definitely got Shadala on board with her on this campaign against Colleen. She just really made it her mission to just really trash Colleen's name. And a lot of people ran with it. A lot of people, you know, thought Colleen was racist, that she hated black guys, and she hated all black people now. There wasn't really any truth at all to any of it. And Krista is just getting started. We would leave the dorms during the day and go to school. And I remember at the end of the day, Colleen went to her room. And it had been just completely trashed. And she had had some, some things stolen, and some jewelry, some money stolen. And, all of her belongings were just, like, dumped in the center of the room. I looked at Krista. I immediately looked at Krista. And she kind of smirked and said, what? I said, did you do that to her stuff? Krista said, no. But I know who did. So who did it? Chris is like, I'm not going to tell you. And then walked away. She would always change the subject. If I kept, who did it? I want to know. I'm not telling you. I don't know who she talked into doing it, or what she offered them, or what stakes they had in it, but she was behind it. But Krista doesn't realize she's finally pushed Colleen too far. Colleen knew that Krista had been in trouble a lot. She knew that if she got in trouble anymore, that she would be banned from the program. There was a system in place where you got so many points, you had to eventually leave the Job Corps Center. You would get sent home for good. Krista had already been in so much trouble. She had been reprimanded for various things and for being in Tadero's room after hours, for fighting and skipping school. Colleen did finally go to somebody about Krista and all the bullying she had been dealing with with Krista. The disciplinary board convenes and will render a decision about Krista's fate at Job Corps after they conduct an investigation. Krista was really upset that Colleen had went to the powers that be about her. You could kind of just see the smoke coming from her ears. She was devastated because she knew that she would lose all the friends who followed her. She would have to go home to a menial existence. She had no future at that point. And it's not just her own future that's at stake. Krista found out she was pregnant. Krista was totally excited. We had talked about, you know, when we grow up, we're gonna have babies and live next door to each other and, you know, raise our kids together. So her party was already started. She told everyone right away that she was pregnant. She was very happy about it and wanted to be a mommy, wanted to have Daryl's baby. 
Krista may know what she wants, but the same can't be said for Tadaryl. I don't think he was, quote unquote, as obsessed about her as she was him. Tadaryl certainly wasn't prepared to be a father. He didn't have much drive in his classes. He didn't have a lot of direction. And the fact that he claimed to be a Satanist, he was open about that. You know, like, what? And then a couple days later, or it might have been a week, she was gone for a couple days. She was gone for a couple days. I found out she went to the hospital because she had a miscarriage. Things got really sad with Krista after that. They got kind of dark, and she was in a really bad place. I think she wanted to blame the miscarriage on somebody. And I remember her and Tadaro were having a lot of fights. They seemed to not be in that lovey-dovey state anymore after that experience. The smallest things would spark an argument. And some of them were very explosive to the point of, I wondered sometimes, are, is she going to hit him? Is he going to hit her? They would have knockdown, drag out fights. We heard rumors that Tadaro would hit Krista, and Krista would attack Tadaro. Finally, the school disciplinary board issues a ruling on Colleen's complaint about Krista. And they told Krista she was on her last strike. She should have been sent home. But they let her stay. I remember everybody coming back after Christmas and being happy and being in a brighter place. It seemed like it was probably going to be better. It definitely felt lighter. Krista comes back to campus a changed and nicer person. Krista, she would walk by Colleen and wave at her. She seemed like she wanted to be friends. Krista was going to make friends with Colleen. And I remember thinking, that's good. That's nice to hear. Colleen thought, you know what? This can end now. We don't have to be best friends, but we'll be OK. Colleen was happy. I think she had had a good break you know, maybe expecting to have a better year. Even Krista and Tadaryl seem to be back in one another's good graces. Things seemed to be going smoother. There were less hassles, less confrontations, and everyone was getting along at that point. Krista went looking for Colleen, and when she found her on campus, she asked her if she would like to go to the video store with her and help to pick out a movie. And Colleen was excited about that. I recall being outside sitting, and uh, Colleen made a concerted effort to come up to me and just all smiles and just happy. She was wearing, uh, I think, some of the clothes that she you know, received for Christmas. She was wearing blue jeans and a pinkish type, you know, long sleeve sweater. You had to sign out and sign back in at the guard shack to leave or come onto the properties. On their way out, Tadaryl and Shadola ask if they can come too. And I seen Colleen, Krista, Tadaryl, and Shadola sign out. Four people signed out that night. Three came back. There was a couple walking in Tyson Park. They came across what they found to be a spot of blood, or they believed to be a spot of blood along the pathway. As he walked down the path, he saw what he believed to be an animal, perhaps a dog. And then he looked a little bit closer, and he realized it wasn't an animal. It was a human being. So you can imagine his horror. He calls the cops. The cops get there, and they're like, holy, you know what? I think the crime scene itself took up about 250 feet uh, in a circle. 
I found a piece of pavement there that was bloody. You can see the imprints of hands in the mud. Then the body was laying at the base of this pile of dirt. It was pretty bloody. And she was nude from waist up. There was items of clothing in the tree. In another tree, there was a bra, a bloody bra. But I did not think that it was a sexual assault. I can't imagine they put part of the clothes back on and not all the clothes back on. And the way she was cut and hacked, that's not just average rape, murder. I knew it was two or more. Because you could see certain tracks of certain places. And so we had an idea that it was a group of people. And it told us that they were mad at her. Something was going other than just stranger meeting stranger on a bicycle trail. A closer look at the body reveals more about the horrors of the night before. There was multiple slashes across her forehead and across her, of course, the body. Her throat was cut seven times. But what actually caused the death was the, the piece of pavement. The chunk of asphalt that was beside the body, that was the murder weapon. And there was a piece of the skull missing. It was obvious. There was a piece missing there. You have a body of a white female. She's been the victim of a homicide. To find somebody sort of tossed aside, sliced up, and nude from a, the waist up, is that's all a message. It was just a horrendous whole scene. Authorities had no idea who the victim was. It was assumed that it was a student but they really had no clue. No one wants to know more than the college students living in Knoxville, whose sense of safety has been shattered. We were told to, you know, stick together off campus, and not to be by ourselves when we were out and about. You had a lot of students that left, that just went home. And you had a lot of students that were just in shock. I can't even explain it. I mean, how, how do you react to something like that? I was at home at the time listening to local news. Anna recalled them reporting what she was wearing. And at that time, I told my wife, and I remember this distinctly, telling her, I think that might be a girl. I, I think that might be a girl I know from Job Corps. Little is known about the body in the woods, including her identity. But the investigation is just getting started. I got a radio dispatch to go to the hospital. They need to see me right away. And when I got there, they showed me the body once it had been cleaned. And then the body once it had been cleaned. And then there it was. Down star, and it represents the goat head of Satan. And the two up points are the, the horns. The down part is the head and nose of the goat. It just took the investigation in a whole different direction as far as possible assailants. So I took that information. I alerted everyone at the station. Don't talk about it. Don't say nothing. That's going to be important. But if anything comes into Satanism, I want to know no matter what time or day. And about 3.30, I got a phone call from him. He said, Randy, we just got a call from a lady out of Jackson, Tennessee. And she's real worried about her daughter. I said, well, OK. He said, well, she mentioned Satanism. I said, what did she say? She said that her daughter is in Job Corps and that she knows a bunch of kids involved in Satanism, and she's really scared. The woman's daughter is safe and sound in the Job Corps dorm. She is not tied to the murder in any way. But the information she provides gives detectives an idea. So I went to the Job Corps Center, and I asked a security guard there. I said, do you have a sign-in and out sheet for students? He said, yes, we do. I said, will you check yesterday about such a time and see who signed out and see if any didn't sign in? So he checked. 
And the logbook indicated that four people had signed out. It was Krista Pike to Darrell Ship, and Shadala Peterson and Colleen Slimmer. My victim was, of course, the one that didn't sign back in. That was Colleen Slimmer. Chris had just come barreling through the door. The level of manic excitement, I had never seen just giddy, happy, manic, dancing around. And I'm thinking, what in the hell is wrong with you? Then she just unfolded. Chris had just spilled everything that had just happened in the last hour and a half. She said, me to Daryl, and Shadala just went at her. She kept begging. So please not kill her. And they just kept on and kept at her. And then Krista shows, she's like, oh, and I got a surprise. She pulls this tissue out of her pocket, and it was a piece of skull. The actual bone. I stood there with my mouth wide open, not knowing what to do, what, to, what do I say? And then Chris is like, OK, well, if you tell anybody, I'll kill you. Love you. Bye. And I stood there for what felt like an hour, just standing there, not saying anything, not moving, just looking at the door, because I didn't know what to do. When police learn the body is Colleen Slemmer, they notify her family immediately. I actually didn't think it was true. I didn't believe it. No mother usually does. And I just thought it was a big mix up. You don't have solid evidence. If it's, you know, your child dies or a family dies, you really have to see it to know that they're dead. But they wouldn't let me see her body because they said it was too tore up. I still didn't really believe it until we did the dental records. To this day, I sometimes don't believe it is her, but I know it is. It was Colleen. Detective York brought in Krista to Daryl Ishidola for questioning. All three are put in different rooms. Krista is interviewed first. When I started out the interview with Krista, she was happy and giddy. I've never seen anybody like this. I asked her, I said, I'm, I'm here to talk to you about a body that was found. And then she interceded and said, you mean Colleen? I just let her talk. I just let her go. She said her intention was not to kill her. But once it got started, she knew that she had to. She hit her, knocked her down, and it was just a melee after that. And then the other two jumped in and helped do the cutting and slicing and stuff on the victim. There was a, a point where they ordered her to take off her top part of the clothes to keep her from running off. And the more she talked about it, the more excited she got. And she was reliving what took place. Krista admits that she cut Colleen's throat and smashed her head with the asphalt. And then took the box cutter and cut out a piece of the skull and wrapped it up. She felt like Colleen was trying to take her boyfriend away from her. And I found nothing from anybody to indicate that, but that was the story she told. I wasn't sure I believed in the uh, demon possessed till I met her, and I, I'm strictly believe that girl's got some kind of demon in her. But she didn't want to talk about Satanism. But there's someone who does. So Darrell had a pentagram necklace. I asked him about it, and, and he started telling me about it. And he told me that he'd been involved ever since he was 11 years old. There was a picture of a chance. 
To Darrell, when he when he talked about it, he he seemed to be honest and and with me. He didn't seem excited or anything about it. He indicated that all that was an afterthought; that that wasn't planned. I was scared. He thought that there was just going to be a fight between the girls. That they thought they were going out there and beat her up. But when it all just transpired, you either get involved or you get out. Shadala, she tried to play everything off as like she was just there, that she didn't do anything. Shadola was afraid of Krista. Everyone was afraid of Krista. And she just wasn't going to see that rage and uh, that anger turned on her. Krista was the ringleader, and it pretty much set in concrete that she led the pack. Krista, Tadaryl, and Shadola are all charged with murder. It was horrible. I couldn't believe that I knew someone that was capable of that and that she lived right across the hall from me. Krista was a bully. She single calling out. At the time, I chalked it up as, you know, catty girl behavior. But as a result of all that, this is what happened, and it just kind of hits you like a ton of bricks, and you just feel sick. It breaks my heart that she begged for her life. <laughs> Sorry. You know, what kind of a, kind of creatures are you? My first thought was it wouldn't have happened if Krista hadn't been there, that she had, should have been kicked out a long time ago. Same with Tadaryl. I think her motive was just to show that she was bigger and badder than somebody. I think she saw Colleen as a threat, and there was enough people there that said something, and it could have been and should have been different. I think that it could have definitely been prevented. Krista was tried 14 months after Colleen was killed. I think the trial went about two weeks. This is the skull from the victim, later identified as Colleen Slimmer. All eyes were either on Krista or the witness stand or the jury box to see how the jury was taking it. Krista is found guilty, and sentencing takes place shortly after. The judge asked her to stand up to give her the sentence. The jury's been excused. It is therefore ordered that you shall be put to death by electrocution. Your body shall be subjected to shock by a sufficient current of electricity. <laughs> But not everyone believes that justice is served. The just sentence would be a norm for a norm. Do the exact same thing she did to Colleen, so she can feel the pain in every cut. And maybe it would be good for me just to see that. I was shocked when she was sentenced to death. Gosh, you're so young at 18, and um, how can you really even be held completely responsible for something at 18, but at the same time, the crime was so horrible and so brutal. How can you not be? At his trial, Tadaryl Ship is also found guilty of first-degree murder. Tadaryl's mom asked me to not ask for death. Today is trial. I turned around and said, what are you talking about? Your son deserves just like she's got. Tadaro was given a life sentence with the possibility of parole. He would have to serve at least 25 years uh, in order to be eligible for parole. Shadola makes a deal in exchange for testifying at Krista and Tadaro's trials. She doesn't serve any prison time. I don't know if she had anything to do with that. All I know is that she turned state evidence and she was free. I think Carmen's going to come back to her. 
Krista Pike awaits execution as the only woman on death row in the state of Tennessee. She has been in solitary confinement for over 20 years. I'd say Krista Pike is probably the most evil human being that I've ever been around. The only other names that I can think of uh, of people like this are Gacy or Dahmer, who kept souvenirs of his human victims. You're talking about people who have gone to a, a really dark place. That's not an exaggeration. I look around my house, and I still have Colleen's Christmas presents that she was going to get that year. I still have her roller skating. I still have her clothes. I kept everything. So I got. I will never. So I can start living. On the next Mean Girl Murders. They're both really proving themselves to be a force to be reckoned with. She's turning into a harder, angrier version of herself. You could see the damage that had been done to her. Does anybody believe it? Nobody likes a sore loser. 